بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم آئی ایم ڈاکٹر عارف ظہیر پروفیسر آف ایڈیٹکس پوسٹ گریجویٹ میڈیکل انسٹیٹیوٹ امیر الدین میڈیکل کالج لاہور جنرل ہاسپٹل ٹوڈے آئی ول ڈسکس اے ویری امپارٹنٹ اینڈ کامن ٹاپک آف فیبرائل فٹس آلسو نون ایز فیبرائل سیزرس دا مین آبجیکٹوس of this presentation are the how to define the febrile seizures, uh, their classification, epidemiology, risk factors, causes, differential diagnosis, diagnosis, management and of course the education of the parents about the febrile seizures. So first of all definition, we can define febrile seizures as the seizures that occur between the age of 6 months and 60 months with a temperature of 38 degrees centigrade or 100.4 degree Fahrenheit or higher. The seizures are not the result of central nervous system infection or any metabolic imbalance and that occur in the absence of prior afebrile seizures. The classification of febrile seizures is, broadly speaking, they are divided into two main groups, simple febrile seizures and complex febrile seizures. The simple febrile seizures is the most common type and it is characterized by generalized seizures, usually tonic-clonic and they are associated with fever lasting for a maximum of 15 minutes and are not recurrent within a 24 hour period. So they are tonic-clonic, they are generalized and they last less than 15 minutes and they do not recur in the 24 hours period. But on the other hand, if you talk about the complex febrile seizures, these are the seizures that are more prolonged, generally lasting for more than 15 minutes. They are focal and they reoccur within 24 hours. The febrile status epilepticus is the commonest form of status epilepticus or the commonest cause of status epilepticus in the pediatric population. This is a febrile seizure lasting for more than uh, 30 minutes. Febrile seizures, particularly the simple febrile seizures, they are generally benign and they are not associated with long-term sequelae. However, The complex febrile seizures are a little bit more serious condition and they may be associated with some of the long-term uh, complications, particularly the epilepsy. Now, regarding the epidemiology of febrile seizures, the most common neurologic disorder of infants and young children. The febrile seizures are age-dependent phenomena and they occur between the age of 6 months to 6 uh, years and they occur in about 2 to 4 percent of children younger than 5 uh, years. The peak incidence is between 12 to 18 months of age and there is slight male predominance with estimated male to female ratio. Uh, of 1.6 is to 1. Febrile seizures occur in 30% of those who experience first episode. So there are chances of recurrence in about 30% of patient, uh, children after first episode of febrile convulsions. And this Risk increases to 50% after two or more episodes of febrile convulsions and to more than 50% of the infants younger than one year at the 
a febrile seizure onset. So if, if a child has febrile seizures for the first time, there are 30% chances that he will experience another episode during uh, the subsequent years. Similarly, if there has been uh, two episodes of febrile convulsions, there will be a risk of 50% of having um, another episode of febrile convulsions. Um, the risk increases to 50% or even more than that if the child um, is younger than one year of age at the onset of febrile seizures. Two to seven percent of children experience febrile seizures and later on develop epilepsy, particularly those children who uh, experience complex febrile seizures or status epilepticus due to the fever. There are certain risk factors about the febrile seizures. Number one is the age. As already mentioned, the age of the child um, uh, is between six months to six years. Most of the uh, children who experience uh, febrile convulsions or seizures, they are between um, 18 months to two years. The infections may be of diverse um, type, particularly the viral infections, human herpes virus 6, influenza virus, then immunization with DTP and MMR, uh, they can cause fever. So there are many causes of fever which can ultimately end up with febrile convulsions and these children are more prone to have um, febrile convulsions because of, because of their genetic susceptibility. Family history of febrile convulsions is present in 10 to 20 percent of the children and in these children uh, the mode of transmission is generally autosomal dominant trait. There are certain risk factors of febrile seizures. The major risk factors and minor risk factors. The major risk factors are age, Generally, these children are less than one year of age. Then, the duration of fever, which is generally less than 24 hours, and the fever is in the range of 38 to 39 degrees centigrade, or 100.4 to 100.2.2 degree Fahrenheit. Then, there are certain minor risk factors, and these minor risk factors are family history of febrile seizures, the father might be having a history of febrile convulsions in his childhood or the mother may have history of febrile seizures in the, uh, in the childhood. Then there may be family history of epilepsy. There may be some epileptic um, uh, family members. Then the complex febrile seizures which I have already um, described that these are the seizures which are which last more than 15 minutes, they are generally focal and they recur in the 24 hours period. So the complex febrile seizures, they are also a risk factor for developing epilepsy in the later um, part of the life. Similarly, they are more prone to have febrile recurrence of febrile seizures. Similarly, in daycare center and uh, male gender, and it has been found that the low serum sodium at the time of presentation uh, may be a risk factor for recurrence of febrile seizures. So there are multiple factors which are responsible for recurrence of febrile seizures. And similarly, there are multiple factors which account for the subsequent development of epilepsy in a child who is having febrile convulsions. The risk of developing epilepsy is just 1% if the child has simple febrile seizures. And if there are recurrent simple febrile seizures, the risk increases to 4%. The complex febrile seizures, the risk is 6% or more. Similarly, if a patient has fever for less than one hour before developing febrile seizures, the risk of having epilepsy in the later life is in the range of 11%. Family history of epilepsy, the risk will be 
and in case of complex febrile seizures, the risk goes as high as 29%. Similarly, if there is neurodevelopmental abnormalities, the risk is further increased to 33%. If a child has more than one risk factor, the risk of developing epilepsy uh, further increases to manifest. We have to establish the cause of fever. The cause of fever is generally upper respiratory tract infection or infection caused by many of the viruses, particularly human herpes virus 6, which causes a disease known as Roseola infantum. Similarly, the infections caused by Shigella and Compilobacter uh, usually manifest as uh, gastroenteritis. And influenza or the common cold, similarly urinary tract infection, which are fairly common in the uh, pediatric population. These are the common causes which lead to fever and fever then ultimately lead to convulsions. The differential diagnosis, one of the most important differential diagnosis is the central nervous system infection, which may be meningitis or encephalitis. And in some cases, it may be cerebral malaria. Meningitis must be differentiated from the simple uh, febrile seizures because if the diagnosis is delayed or if the diagnosis is not made and the treatment is delayed, then the child is going to have very um, complications of the disease. So they should be suspected and they should be diagnosed with appropriate investigation and they should, they should be managed with appropriate antibiotics so that they do not develop the complication and recover very soon. Similarly, there may be other conditions which must be differentiated from febrile convergence like genetic epilepsies, like shivering or uh, uh, or Rikers as in case of malaria, then metabolic imbalance, particularly the hypocalcemia, hypoglycemia, they can cause convulsions and then there are certain drugs uh, uh, which can cause convulsions in a child who take them accidentally. Diagnosis of this condition is based on history, physical examination and, and investigation. So in the history, we must ask about the type of fever, whether focus generalized, its duration of fever, so that we can differentiate between simple and complex partial seizures. So always focus on the history of fever, duration of fever, and then the exposure to uh, different conditions, for example, exposure is to a child having uh, measles in the family, mumps in the family, or chicken pox in the family. So most of the viral infection can cause fever and the child can develop convulsions as a result of fever, which could be 38 degree centigrade or, or higher than. The history of history of the cause of fever, particularly viral illness, gastroenteritis should be elucidated. The antibiotic use is particularly important because the patient may have partially treated by meningitis. We should keep in mind the antibiotic use or the type of antibiotics which the patient has received in the last couple of days. History of seizures in the past is very important. If there is a history of a febrile convulsions in a child, that may not be a case of febrile seizures. And in such cases, we will have to rule out the um, epilepsy uh, resulting from uh, many conditions, or it may be idiopathic. In the history, the trauma and the ingestion of toxic substances must be uh, ruled out. If any history of febrile seizures is very important as 
uh, if there is family history of febrile seizures, particularly in the parents or siblings, the risk of having febrile seizures is increased. The history of recent vaccination is very important. Um, vaccination may lead to high grade fever and patient can have few uh, convulsions. Similarly, the um, DPT vaccine, particularly the pertussis vaccine, may cause high grade fever and um, convulsions or it, it may have central nervous system effects and can cause convulsions in a child who has been vaccinated. Now, the physical examination is very important. A detailed neurological assessment is very important, including, including the um, head circumference of the child, examination of the cranial nerves, examination of the motor system, and even the examination uh, for the uh, various storage disorders. Fundoscopy is of course very important, it should be carried out when and wherever possible. Uh, try to find out the cause of fever, which could be otitis media, pharyngitis, or other viral infections. Uh, full neurological assessment is, is the uh, hallmark of making a good diagnosis. Then in the, in the ward, once the child is admitted, a serial evaluation of the patient's neurological status is essential if the, if the, um, the neurological status of the child is deteriorating, we have to modify our treatment and we have to modify our investigation plan. Always check for the meningeal signs if the child develops meningeal signs like neck stiffness, Cunning signs, Brzezinski sign, then of course the lumbar puncture of the child will become mandatory and the CSF report will guide us in the treatment of the child. The investigations, the most important investigations are as follows. Number one is the blood studies. Complete blood count should be sent if the TLC is raised and there are a large number of or a greater percentage of neutrophils that will indicate CNS infection and or some other bacterial uh, infection. Uh, so the cause or the focus of the uh, infection must be sought. Similarly, the metabolic profile should be done like serum electrolytes but, uh, and uh, serum calcium, phosphorus, magnesium. Lumbar puncture. Lumbar puncture is not indicated in each and every patient. If a child presents with fever and convulsions and within a uh, few minutes or few hours, the child becomes fully conscious, active, alert, there is no, and there is no need to do the lumbar puncture. But lumbar puncture should be performed when there are meningeal signs or symptoms or other clinical features strongly suggestive of meningitis or intracranial infection, whatever the age may be. Similarly, lumbar puncture should be considered in infants younger than six months, especially if the immunization status against hemophilus influenzae, type B or streptococcus pneumoniae is deficient or undetermined. The lumbar puncture should be considered when the patient is on antibiotics because antibiotic treatment can mask the signs and symptoms of meningitis and the patient might have recovered to some extent because of oral or IV antibiotics and signs of meningitis irritation may be absent. So this may be misleading and we may, we may miss the diagnosis of meningitis and early stoppage of antibiotics may ultimately lead to uh, recurrence of uh, meningitis and that may be associated with fatal outcome and there may be a very high uh, morbidity uh, leading to the neurological deficits, cranial nerve palsies and later on epilepsy and intellect impairment. Now electrophysiological studies, the EEG is not generally required. It is only recommended when there is 
history of complex febrile seizures or when or when the child is neurologically abnormal or has some uh, motor deficit if a child is developmentally normal and had febrile convulsions and later on becomes very active alert and has no neurological deficit eeg should not be done in equivocal cases where we recommend eeg it should be done uh, about 2 weeks after the episode of febrile convulsions because immediately after the febrile convulsions there may be some spikes in the eeg pattern that may misguide us and we we may st- we may start um, the uh, anti convulsions which are actually not required so uh, there are very there is very limited role of doing eeg then neuroimaging similarly uh, the neuroimaging is not generally required the ct and mri is not required in each and every patient who has uh, febrile seizures particularly simple febrile seizures now the children who have some complex febrile seizures and those who have some neurological deficits those who have some developmental delay they might need ct scan or mri to establish the neurological uh, cause or the status of the brain there are very there are very large number of brain abnormalities which can present with convulsions sometimes the child has actually epilepsy but the episode of convulsions is precipitated by fever so these children do not have febrile convulsions we say they this is basically the episode of epilepsy which has been epileptic convulsions which has been precipitated by the fever so once there is neurological deficit once there is a uh, developmental delay and the child has presented with fever and convulsions we can order ct and mri but in a straight forward case of febrile seizures in which the child presented with fever and convulsions convulsions which settled uh, within a short period of time and now the child is not uh, having any neurological deficit and there are no signs of any irritation the ct and mri they are not generally recommended no management of the febrile seizures by the time the child reaches the emergency the seizures have ended in most of the child and if the child is normal active there is no need to sedate the children with diazepam we can observe these children for few hours and then after diagnosing the cause of fever we can send these children but in children with febrile seizures that continue for more than 5 minutes intravenous benzodiazepines like diazepam in a dose of 0.1 to 0.2 mg per kg or lorazepam in a dose of 0.05 to 0.1 mg per kg can be given midazolam can be given orally or per rectum in order to control the convulsions the patients with continued seizures despite initial benzodiazepines administration or those who have entered into the status epileptic state should be treated promptly with additional anticonvulsants like phenobarbital and valproic acid most children with simple febrile seizures do not require hospital admission and they can be discharged safely to home as they have returned to normal baseline and parents have been educated about the risk of recurrent febrile seizures diazepam at the first onset of fever for duration of the febrile seizure will be effective but will sedate the child 
and complicate the evaluation for the source of the fever. So diazepam can be used prophylactically, particularly where the parents are very much anxious that their child may develop febrile convulsions. So in these children we can give diazepam in order to prevent the febrile seizures along with the supportive treatment or the measures to reduce the fever like parastamol, like sponging, etc. The long term use of anticonvulsants is not recommended after febrile seizures. However, we have to consider the use of long uh, term uh, anticonvulsants in children who have some neurological deficit or developmental delay or where the parents are very anxious and worried about the, the, uh, about the recurrences um, because this is a very terrifying experience. The parents uh, think that their child is not going to survive as the child is convulsing and the child has froth in his mouth and has turned blue. So the, this, this is a very terrifying experience and they don't want, don't want to see it again. So on, if the child is having a repeated episode of convulsions, uh, then uh, in some cases we can use the anticonvulsants on long term basis. Otherwise these are not anymore recommended in a child who is having febrile. Sponging is very vital when the child is having high grade fever. Similarly, antipyretics should be given. And if there is bacterial application, uh, if there is bacterial infection like otitis media, like pharyngitis, or some other bacterial infection like pneumonia, or maybe simple large abscess or boil, then we have to uh, prescribe the. Uh, appropriate antibiotics to the child. Then in the last, the parental education and reassurance is very important. Parents should be counseled about the relative risk of recurrence of febrile convulsions and the chances of epilepsy in the later life. Parents should be educated how to handle a seizure accurately. So whenever a child develops febrile convulsions at home, parents should be able to um, manage this at home. They should start sponging of the child and uh, they should remove the clothes of the child and they can use um, per rectum uh, diazepam to control the convulsions. But if the fits are not controlled um, even after five minutes, they should rush to the, to the nearby uh, health facility and where the child can be managed with IV diazepam to control the convulsions. Thank you very much.